Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New England Aquarium's lecture series for the fall 2018 season. This is actually the final lecture of our season. I'd like to acknowledge generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allows the aquarium to offer these programs free of charge, and we're grateful for their support each season. Before the lecture starts, we ask you to please silence your cell phones until the end of the event. For those of you who haven't been here before, bathrooms are located up the stairs, through those back doors, uh, and on the right. To get started, I'm Kelly Chris. I'm the Aquarium's Director of Conservation Policy and Leadership. As a conservation organi organization, the Aquarium is committed to working with decision makers both locally and in Washington, D.C. to ensure that our ocean and its living resources are managed responsibly and sustainably. I only started this job six months ago, but already we've been working on important policy issues, including marine protected areas, sustainable fisheries, climate change, and offshore oil and gas. Each of these issues will be touched upon tonight during tonight's lecture by Dave Bolton, who is a friend, a colleague, and a mentor. I met Dave while I was working at the State Department. Together with a team of committed State Department staff, we organized Secretary Kerry's first Our Ocean Conference. Secretary's Kerry, Secretary Kerry's vision has endured past his tenure at the State Department. Just last week, Indonesia hosted the fifth consecutive Our Ocean Conference. Dave spent 32 years at the State Department, 25 of those he spent working on ocean issues. In 2006, Dave was confirmed by the Senate as the ambassador for the ocean. He also served as the Deputy Assist Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries until he retired earlier this year. I think it's fair to say that Dave had a role in nearly every international fisheries agreement that the United States entered into during his time at the State Department. From 2015 to 2017, Dave, uh, Dave served as the chair of the senior Arctic officials when the United States chaired the Arctic Council. He is now a senior fellow in the Polar Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center. His lecture tonight is entitled Diplomacy and Intrigue in the Arctic. Please welcome Dave to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. I'm really happy to be here. I want to thank the New England Aquarium for inviting me. I'd like to thank Kelly in particular for making making this happen. Show of hands, please. How many of you have ever been north of the Arctic Circle? OK, a few. Well, if I had asked that question of Americans generally, uh, a much smaller percentage would have responded that way. I think for most Americans, the Arctic is essentially unknown. It is a, thought of as a remote, desolate place. Indeed, when I asked one of my high school friends who now lives in the area to come, uh, who she's actually here tonight, and I thank her for that. Her response email was just entitled, Frozen Tundra? And I think that's how many people think of the Arctic. A, a shockingly few Americans realize that the United States is one of the eight Arctic nations, thanks, of course, to Alaska. Now, the Arctic has been in the news, rather a lot, actually, for those who are looking, but often the news gets the story wrong. Here's a headline from a few years back about the Arctic. The next land rush. You have an image of the settlers you know, racing out to the Oklahoma Territory to stake their claims as if uh, nobody ever had lived there before. <coughs> People talk about a new Cold War in the Arctic as if we're on the brink of armed conflict. I assure you we are not, not in the Arctic. Time Magazine ran a headline not that long ago, who owns the Arctic, as if nobody owns it today, or at least there are questions about who owns it. Once again, not true. Closer to the mark, though, Time ran um, a piece about climate change in the Arctic. Yes, we will be talking about climate change in the Arctic. And in, indeed, much of the Arctic that people have known is vanishing. And yeah, even Stephen Colbert got into the act at some point. Another show of hands, please. How many of you have spent appreciable time looking at a map of the world with the North Pole in the middle? Yeah, a few. 
few Arctic policy wonks. Glad you're here. Well, for those of you who haven't, let's just get oriented a little bit. I'll see if I can do this with this pointer. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, here's the United States. That's the north coast of Alaska right there. This is the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. Here's the top of Greenland. Greenland is still part of the Kingdom of Denmark, at least for now. Down here is Iceland. The very top of, I of Iceland touches the Arctic Circle. Here we have Norway, including the islands of Svalbard, sometimes called Spitsbergen, Sweden and Finland, and all the rest is Russia. There are people living in the Arctic. It's not a park. It's not like Antarctica, where there's no permanent population. There's some four million people living north of the Arctic Circle today, that number is growing. For a lot of them, their ancestors have been living there for thousands of years. Indeed, the Arctic indigenous peoples are quite politically active. I'll be talking later about the Arctic Council and how the indigenous peoples of the north participate in that. One other thing before we leave this map, this purple line, that describes a kind of polygon is 200 miles from the closest point of shore at every place. That 200 mile line is actually pretty important as we'll see a few slides later. Here's another picture of the same thing without the political designations on it. We're here at an aquarium, right? So this is an ocean's map or an ocean's picture. Fairly shallow waters off of Russia in particular, narrower margins here and off the top of Alaska, though it comes out to the Chukchi Plateau here. This is the Lomonosov Ridge crossing right basically over the North Pole, another less well-expressed set of ridges called the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge. And there is a deep ocean basin on both that side and down in here. The Arctic is, of course, changing. When I started giving these talks, I used to say, the Arctic is warming on average twice as fast as the rest of the planet. That's not true any longer. Now I say, the Arctic is warming more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Even if the commitments in the Paris Climate Accord are met, the Arctic will still continue to warm. Up in the right-hand corner, you see a chart showing the extent of Arctic sea ice at its lowest ebb each year. It tends to be in September. From 1979, I think it goes to uh, 2016 or 17. You can definitely see the downward trend, right? Quite alarming. The pictures in the lower left show the extent of Arctic sea ice both in 1984 and again in 1912, a rather dramatic difference. And here, if I can get this to play, there it is. So this is a YouTube video. You could see it yourself. You could type in, in YouTube, Arctic sea ice time lapse. In the upper left-hand corner, you could see the months going by. It started in the mid-80s. This will carry us through to uh, 2016, I believe. What you're seeing as the seasons ebb and flow is the extent of sea ice ebbing and flowing. The darkest ice, or I should say the brightest ice, the whitest ice, is the multi-year ice. In the chart on the lower right, that's the column all the way to the right-hand side. And for the first decade or so of this, not that much has changed, right? The long-term sea ice, the extent of the total sea ice in the winter and summer don't actually move all that much. But beginning about now, the picture begins to change rather radically. The effects of climate change in the Arctic are starting to become more apparent. Multi-year ice is diminishing 
the full extent of sea ice is also diminishing radically. And by 2012, it was really almost not there. And indeed, scientists predict that in the next couple of decades, the Arctic is likely to be ice-free entirely for part of the year. Not only is the sea ice receding and the sea surface temperatures warming, the ocean is also becoming more acidic. It turns out then when, that the, the carbon dioxide that we emit, roughly a third of that deposits into the ocean, mixes with the ocean, changes the chemistry of the ocean. It lowers the pH, raises the acidity level. On average around the world, the oceans are today 30% more acidic than they were just at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it turns out that cold water absorbs more carbon dioxide than warm water, such that the polar oceans, the Arctic Ocean and the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, are becoming even more acidic on average. This is all bad news. It's bad news if you're a polar bear or another ice-dependent species. It's bad news if you're a resident of the Arctic. There are a lot of coastal towns in the Arctic, particularly in Alaska and Canada, that have, since time immemorial, been protected from the action of waves and currents because sea ice has frozen fast up onto the shore year-round. But now, these same coastlines are exposed for at least part of the year, leading to very serious erosion. Whole towns in Alaska are going to be needing to move inland, same in Canada, probably in parts of Russia as well. A lot of Arctic infrastructure is built on what had been permanently frozen ground, the so-called permafrost. Well, a lot of it isn't permanently frozen anymore. It's starting to thaw, it's starting to sag, and the infrastructure built on it, the pipelines, the towns, the sewers, the roads, railways, are seriously affected. And as the permafrost thaws, carbon dioxide and methane that have been trapped inside the permafrost are released into the atmosphere, causing more warming. Another of these vicious cycles is occurring with the sea ice. The sea ice is white, right? It tends to reflect a good portion of the sun's energy. But when the sea ice melts and is replaced by darker water, that surface absorbs more of the heat, leading to further warming, further melting, even less re reflectivity. And of course, people are worried about sea level rise. We haven't actually seen very much yet. And the melting of the Arctic sea ice does not actually raise the sea level. It's like the ice in your water glass. When it melts, the level of water doesn't actually change, not appreciably. But when land ice melts, when the Greenland ice sheet melts. When that water runs into the ocean, then we will start seeing the sea level rising. And I have to tell you, the Greenland ice sheet is starting to melt. A friend of mine likes to say the fate of Miami and other low-lying places around the world is really the fate of Greenland. And he's not wrong. Of course, and this is somewhat ironic, the warming of the Arctic is making places more accessible than they had been before. And I realize these are pretty busy maps, but what they show, the story they tell, is that a significant portion of the world's untapped oil and gas lie in the Arctic, much of it within Russia. The slide on the left is um, the estimated untapped oil, the slide on the right, gas. Of course, the very possibility of exploiting these resources and burning these hydrocarbons, what, what's that going to do? It's going to lead to more warming. And not just that, there are, of course, very real risks to offshore oil development. This is a picture not from the Arctic, but from the deep water horizon disaster a few years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, most of you probably remember. 
Notice how the waters are calm. The seas are warm. You wouldn't know that from the picture, but take my word. There are a lot of vessels and infrastructure nearby to help. It was still an unmitigated disaster. Imagine something like that in the Arctic. Much, much worse. Another opportunity created by the Arctic climate change is, of course, Arctic shipping. We have already begun to see some increases in shipping into and out of the Arctic, particularly the Russian Arctic. We have also seen some trans-Arctic shipping beginning, not that much, though. One reason people are interested in the Arctic, well, let me stop to just point out the two basic routes. The lower picture is actually the more relevant one. This is the route across the top of Russia, commonly known as the Northern Sea Route. It's more relevant simply because that is the side of the Arctic that is melting first. And there have been a number of transits of the Northern Sea Route, including most uh, recently by a container ship for the first time. I think it left from Korea. The upper map shows a series of routes through the top of Canada that collectively are known as the Northwest Passage, the fable North Northwest Passage for those of you who are Arctic policy wonks. People are interested in this for the following reason. If you were on a boat traveling from London to Tokyo and you went through the Panama Canal, you would need to sail 23,000 kilometers. You could save some of that distance by going instead through the Suez Canal, a little bit shorter of a route. <coughs> Excuse me, but if you went the same, between the same two ports, through the Northwest Passage, it's really a lot shorter, isn't it? But before you go investing in Arctic, sh Arctic shipping companies, know this, the Arctic is not well charted yet. The infrastructure on land necessary to support large-scale shipping doesn't really exist yet. Telecommunications in the Arctic are still subpar. And even with Arctic warming, it will still be, for the Arctic will still be frozen over, at least for a portion of every year. So all of these are pretty serious hurdles to large-scale Arctic shipping. And yet it will increase at least some. I'd like to take you back to where the first slides began. There was talk of a land rush or a new Cold War. Who owns the Arctic? What was that all about anyway? There is no piece of land anywhere in the Arctic that is in dispute, except one. There's a small island between Canada and Greenland that both the Kingdom of Denmark and Canada claim is theirs. I'm telling you, we're not going to war over that island. But there is another situation that's kind of interesting, and you need to know a little international law to appreciate it. And I'm going to give a little seminar now. It has to do with what's called the continental shelf. Imagine you're standing in Provincetown, looking due east. Or in San Francisco, looking due west. Or in Point Barrow, Alaska, looking due north. And you ask yourself, how far out from shore, is it still the United States? And now we're talking about the land under the water, not the water, just the land under the water. You're standing on the coast, in some cases it's a coastal baseline, and you're asking about this, the continental shelf. How far out does it go? Well, the basic rule is 200 nautical miles from shore, slightly more than 200 road miles. Why does it matter? Ah, the country that has a continental shelf gets all of the resources on and under the shelf, in particular any oil, gas, minerals embedded in the land under the water. And here's the thing. Under certain circumstances, countries can claim a continental shelf wider than 200 miles from shore, a so-called extended continental shelf. How far out does that go? Well, it depends. This is where it gets kind of complicated. It depends on whether that added piece 
can be shown to be a natural prolongation of the continent on which the country sits. Where are all these rules found? They're found in a treaty, the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea. What does all this mean for the Arctic? Well, now we come back to a very complicated Arctic map. Let's get us reoriented just briefly. Once again, here is Alaska, Canada, right? Kingdom of Denmark, Norway, including Svalbard and Russia. So the first 200 miles from shore, remember this dotted line is the 200 mile line. The land under this water, in this case, belongs to Alaska, this belongs to Canada, Denmark, Norway, Russia. But what about the land beyond 200 miles under the water? It turns out that almost all of that area, 2.8 million square kilometers, qualifies as continental shelf of somebody. And those, the five countries who rim this area are in the process of establishing the outer limits of their continental shelves. Are we going to war over this? No. What do countries do when their maritime claims overlap? They negotiate boundary agreements. In fact, the US and Russia did that already. Back when it was the Soviet Union, the US and Soviet Union negotiated this boundary line. It actually is part of the longest maritime boundary in the world. It continues down through the Bering Sea and into the North Pacific. So the Russian claim to continental shelf here will not overlap with the US claim. We have a boundary agreement. Interestingly, we don't have one with Canada. Yeah, every place it's possible for the US and Canada to have a boundary dispute, we have one. In the Arctic, outside, uh, in the Dixon entrance between Southeast Alaska and the north part of British Columbia, outside the Strait of Juan de Fuca between Washington State and the southern part of British Columbia, and not so far from here in the Gulf of Maine. Yeah, we have not been able to negotiate boundary agreements with each other, our Canadian friends. Norway and Russia did negotiate a boundary agreement recently, but some of the other states have not successfully done so, and they're going to need to do so. But they will do so with lawyers and geographers and geologists and seismologists, not with warships. And to underscore the point that this is actually a pretty collaborative exercise, I've given you a picture here of the US Coast Guard cutter, the Healy, working together with the Canadian Coast Guard cutter, the Louis Saint Laurent, a few years ago. What were they doing? They were exploring the outer limits of both countries' continental shells up in the Beaufort Sea sharing their data, working together, breaking ice for one another. We're not going to war over this. I'd like to turn now to how the Arctic is governed today. The primary way in which the Arctic countries deal with Arctic issues is through a kind of mini United Nations for the Arctic. It was created in 1996, 22 years ago. It's called the Arctic Council. It meets every two years at the so-called ministerial levels. The foreign ministers of all eight countries, including the US Secretary of State, attends these meetings. Here you have pictures starting on the left. Uh, the ministerial meeting in Sweden, Kiruna, Sweden up, Sweden, up in the Arctic in 2013. The middle picture is in Iqaluit, northern Canada in 2015, and there you see Rex Tillerson chairing the meeting when the US was chairing the Arctic Council. Fairbanks, Alaska, May 2017. Who's that guy sitting next to him? The Arctic Council mostly works on protecting the Arctic environment, helping the Arctic develop sustainably. In addition to the eight countries of the Arctic, um, well, I'm sorry, I should talk about this slide first. Uh, what you see here is um, a depiction of how the Arctic Council is set up today. Right now, we're in the Finnish chairmanship. When the US chairmanship ended in 2017, we passed the gavel to Finland. The ministers will meet in Finland in uh, 2019, spring of 2019, about six months from now, to wrap up that chairmanship and start the next one. Iceland takes over next. <clears throat> 
The day-to-day -day work of the Arctic Council is overseen by one official from every country, the senior Arctic officials. There are a series of working groups and task forces that the Arctic Council creates to actually do the work. Now, in addition to the eight countries, and you see the flags on the left, there are these groups of Arctic indigenous peoples. And I'm telling you, as someone who has sat in a lot of international organizations, this is unprecedented. This is unique. The people representing the Arctic indigenous groups are not part of national delegations. They sit at the table in their own name and right and speak on behalf of their communities. The Athabascans, the Aleuts, the Gwich'in, the Inuits, the Sami, and another group just called the Russian Arctic Indigenous Peoples of the North. There you see a picture of the six leaders of those six groups uh, from a couple of years ago. When I was chairing these meetings, I would call on the representative from Denmark and then the Gwich'in Council International. They were all worked together. Any decision that was made was made by consensus of everyone. There are a lot of observers at the Arctic Council as well. A, lo a lot of states that are near the Arctic, and some that are actually not even all that near the Arctic, have become observers. China, Japan, Korea, UK, France, Netherlands, Germany, also India, Singapore. A bunch of intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations come as well. These meetings are pretty big, 39 observers and counting. Oh, and here's where I need to introduce a friend of mine. This is a Ponce de Leon. Maybe you know the original Ponce de Leon. He was a Spanish explorer looking for the fountain of youth. This is his reincarnation, kind of a, a friend of mine. He helped chair the Arctic Council meetings when the US held the chairmanship. You can see he had a, a badge they, uh, they made for him. He used to sit by the gavel. Good conversation piece, really. And yeah, that's John Kerry holding Ponce de Leon. We uh, was at an Arctic meeting. He'd had a beer or two. I remember offering, uh, asking him to take a picture, and he looked at Ponce, and he said, and this is a quote, you've got to be kidding me. And that was the moment before that picture was snapped. The Arctic Council has also started to serve as the venue for negotiating binding agreements among the Arctic states, the first of which dealt with the topic of search and rescue. That alarming picture you see is actually from Antarctica. Some years ago, this vessel, a Canadian tour vessel, sank. Amazingly, there was not a single loss of life only thanks to the fact that it was a clear and calm day, there were enough lifeboats, and there was another vessel nearby able to take everybody on board. But these kinds of vessels are coming increasingly to the Arctic too. And it occurred to the Arctic nations, the governments, that were not well equipped to handle these kinds of potential disasters. So for two years, we worked on this and we came up with a new treaty, the Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement. We divvied up the Arctic, that's the map, for purposes of the agreement only. The idea is if there is a search and rescue need or incident in any one of these areas, the country in whose area it is will take the lead but can ask for help. The countries pool their resources. There's joint training, sharing of data, joint exercises. That was, that was signed in 2011, and then shortly thereafter, two years later, a similar agreement was done on the subject of oil pollution. Similarly, people are starting to worry about a major oil pollution incident in the Arctic. And the countries in question, the possible exception of Norway, are not well prepared for this. So once again, we negotiated a treaty to share resources. We can call on each other to help out in the event such a disaster would occur. That, don't worry, that picture you see was from uh, an experiment being done, what would happen if there were an oil spill in icy waters, and we're testing that. The short answer is, though, it ain't easy to clean up oil in icy waters. And the third such agreement, signed in Fairbanks just a year and a half ago, 
is to enhance scientific cooperation in the Arctic. We hope it will usher in a new age of Arctic science. And for those of you who didn't think that the Trump admi administration believed in such things, there's a picture of Secretary of State Tillerson signing the agreement on behalf of the United States. Outside the Arctic Council, two other agreements have been forged. One was through the International Maritime Organization. This is the group, part of the United Nations, that regulates international shipping. Yeah, we talked about how shipping is increasing in the Arctic. So the rules need to get strengthened, and that's what happened. In 2017, a new set of rules from the IMO came into force relating to security, environmental security, and safety of shipping in polar waters. And most recently, just last month, a new treaty was signed. This one deals with fishing. This takes a little explanation. <clears throat> here on the left, once again, we have the top of Alaska. This area here is the US exclusive economic zone out to 200 miles. In 2009, the US government decided not to allow commercial fishing in this area. Why? The fish were moving there, but we didn't know enough about the science. We didn't have any real handle on what would happen if we permitted X number of tons of Arctic char or polar cod to be caught there, Pacific cod actually moving up. And so until we had that data, until we understood the ocean there, we decided there should be no fishing. This was a move supported by the fishing industry. They were worried about a collapse if they started fishing without really understanding the, the potential consequences. Canada took a similar step just to the east of this area a few years later. The problem, though, is that the jurisdiction of those countries only goes to 200 miles with respect to fishing. Beyond 200 miles, remember, another 200 mile issue, is the high seas. Vessels from any country in the world, in principle, are allowed to fish there. And we were worried that vessels from China or Japan or Korea would come up through the Bering Strait and start fishing at mile 201. And here's a picture of what that high seas area looked like in 2012. It was not completely frozen as it had been since the dawn of history. Thanks to that time-lapse movie you saw, this is what it looked like. A good chunk of it was open ocean. And some of it, the, the part in, um, I guess that's orange or yellow, is fairly shallow water, water where fisheries are thought might be possible. So the five countries that rim this area started talking to one another, US, Canada, Russia, Denmark, and Norway, and then we invited in five others, the ones with large fishing fleets, Japan, China, South Korea, also the European Union, yes, and Iceland too. And what was signed a month ago in Greenland, you may have read about it, got some press, was an agreement not to allow commercial fisheries to start there for at least 16 years until we have enough science. And there is a commitment in the agreement as well to get the science, to start a joint program of scientific research and monitoring for this area designed to figure out what is happening there. Is a commercial fishery possible? How might it be regulated? Interestingly, the Arctic indigenous peoples were part of this process and will be part of the implementation of the agreement. And the agreement will roll over after 16 years for increments of additional five years unless any country objects. And if that were to happen, I think we're then on to the next negotiation, negotiating a new agreement under which fisheries would actually begin, hopefully on a sustainable basis. So I've talked a lot about the different things happening in the Arctic, there's probably no other ocean in the world that has been the subject of five binding treaties. So five treaties just in the last seven years. But that is true of the Arctic. Kind of amazing, actually. And where is all this going? 
There's another exercise underway in the Arctic Council today asking that very question. Do we need some new architecture for the Arctic? Do we need a new marine science organization dedicated solely to the Arctic? I don't know. So I've talked a lot about diplomacy in the Arctic. I haven't talked so much about intrigue. And this was, after all, titled Diplomacy and Intrigue in the Arctic. I think the, I think the intrigue comes from two possible or two, two primary so sources, I'd say. The first comes from Russia. It may have occurred to you that relations between Russia and the United States are not very good at the moment. Indeed, I would say they are surpassingly weird. And it's not just between the US and Russia. It's really between Russia and all seven other Arctic nations. There are profound differences over Ukraine and Syria. Serious questions about Russian meddling in US elections. I could go on. And yet, the countries of the Arctic, Russia and the others, seem to be able to compartmentalize, right? None of the things I've talked about tonight, none of these advances in diplomacy would have been possible otherwise. The countries seem to want to cooperate with one another in the Arctic, presumably because it is in their mutual interest to do so. Will it continue? I don't know. Every time I pick up the newspaper and something yet weirder comes up, I wonder about this. People also worry about China. China is investing serious money in different parts of the Arctic, particularly in Greenland, in Iceland, also in Russia. Should we be concerned about this? Some people are. Some people worry about undue Chinese influence in the Arctic. I don't actually worry quite so much, but it is intriguing and it does bear watching. Anyway, with that, I've come to the end of my slideshow, and I'd be very happy to take questions. Sorry? Sure, I'll do that. One second while I get my title slide back up. Oops, that's not it. There you go. Sir. That much. Thanks. For those who might not have been able to hear, we got uh, first uh, a comment, I'll repeat it, and then the question. The comment was, um, oil is uh, at a price right now that will make additional Arctic recovery of oil uneconomic for the near term, possibly even the mid to longer term. And I think that is right. Indeed, Shell Oil, which had invested billions just to reserve the right to drill for oil north of the Arctic coast has withdrawn from there for a variety of reasons, but primarily because the price of oil fell. Um, it may be a little cheaper 
to recover some new areas of oil and gas off of Russia, there's a separate question about the effect of economic sanctions on Russia and whether that might impede development there. But I think your assumption is right. Unless the price of oil were to go rather seriously north and stay there for a, a period of time, probably the oil companies will not be all that interested in this area. It is expensive to drill for oil in the Arctic. The question had to do with the role of the Coast Guard and whether the Coast Guard needs to be given the resources to do more in the Arctic. And I think the answer is yes. Um, there are two, well, there are several parts that I might mention. Thanks to the U.S. and the U.S. Coast Guard in particular, there was created an Arctic Coast Guard Forum just a few years ago. The eight Arctic Coast Guards now meet annually to talk about common issues. The U.S. and Canadian and U.S. Russian Coast Guards work together every day. I can tell you, on a daily basis, you must know that as well. But you're right, it's in the Alaska region. <coughs> I don't think anybody is thinking the U.S. Coast Guard needs to be deployed off of Norway or Iceland. But it does need new resources. And indeed, Congress has now decided to appropriate money to build at least one new heavy icebreaker. Right now, the U.S. has only one, and it's not in great shape. And we have a medium strength icebreaker as well, the Healy, you saw a picture of it earlier. Uh, within a few years, it's going to take a while, but within a few years there will be now an, a second U.S. heavy icebreaker and possibly others down the road. And yes, the Coast Guard probably should have more resources beyond simply an icebreaker to help deal with its multi-missions in the Arctic. More people are going, they're going to need the Coast Guard there for sure. Other questions, please. Yes, ma'am. The question is about marine protected areas in the Arctic. Um, there has been a growth in declared marine protected areas all over the world. Indeed, there is now a commitment, it's embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals, among other places, uh, that 10% of the world's oceans should be conserved in marine protected areas or similar things. And about a decade ago, we were in the 1% to 2%, and now we're rather higher thanks to announcements of some very large marine protected areas in different parts of the world, including the largest one in the world off of Antarctica, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. Really quite amazing. There are some rather smaller marine protected areas in different parts of the Arctic, including in Russia, you might be interested to know. Um, I wouldn't say that this administration is likely to establish any new marine protected areas off the U.S. coast, in Ala off Alaska, or anywhere else for that matter, rather the reverse. But I think the trend is in that direction. And one of the projects I was involved in with the Arctic Council was to create a network of marine protected areas in the Arctic to be able to share the data from the different studies being done in the MPAs around the region, hopefully to determine where new MPAs would best be created and encourage the individual countries to create them. And I think the direction is, we're heading in that direction. Sir. Yes. Um, background and then the question. Yes. Excellent. I'm guessing you were in Svalbard, right? Sorry? Were you in Svalbard? No, but just you were north of Norway. Is what you... oh, I see. So the question for those who may not have heard it had to do with espionage or other intelligence gathering in the Arctic. Yes, it is going on. But let me ask you this. Think about the places in the world 
that are experiencing armed conflict as we speak. There are quite a few, right? Not in the Arctic. Think about places where large-scale terrorism events, even including within other places in the United States, have been occurring or might be at risk of occurring, not likely to happen in the Arctic. Other ills that the world faces, mass migrations of people, human trafficking, drug trafficking, not so much in the Arctic. The Arctic is actually a fairly peaceful, stable place. There are serious things going on in the Arctic, but they're primarily environmental and socioeconomic. And yes, each of the countries is gathering data on the others, particularly this, the Russian Federation. Um, but you know, when the Russians, I spent a lot of time in Russia and talking to Russian officials, and I'm convinced that when Russians look out at the Arctic, what they see is the source of their future wealth. And what they most want is a fairly peaceful environment within which to develop those resources. Northern Sea Route, the oil and gas resources they have. They're not actually looking for conflict. That doesn't answer the question of why they are rebuilding military institution, uh, in installations in the North. That is true. But I'm, we're not going to war in the Arctic. Sir. Yes, you. So the, the question has to do with um, climate change in the Arctic, whether Russia is actually benefiting from climate change in the Arctic, I think they are in some sense, whether they are less likely to want to actually deal with climate change in the Arctic or elsewhere as a result, I think they probably are climate skeptics, right? Always have been. They, um, they do recognize some serious environmental problems of their own in the Arctic. Some of this is from leftover materiel from past wars and the Cold War that is leaking out into the Arctic. And interestingly, one of the things the Arctic Council does is it funnels a lot of money to Russia to help remediate those things. Um, the Arctic countries alone cannot solve the climate problem, even with the best of will. Um, but it is also true that climate change in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects everybody. But here's one thing that is kind of interesting. Um, black carbon, which you would call soot, gets emitted into the atmosphere. Unlike CO2, it actually falls out of the atmosphere pretty quickly. It doesn't stay in the air very long, a matter of weeks. There is the thought and it's not just a thought. Um, there is um, an initiative to try to reduce emissions of black carbon in the Arctic, which would both be a health benefit but also a climate benefit. It would lessen the problem of reduced reflectivity, right? The black carbon, when it settles on white surfaces, makes for more warming. And a lot of that black carbon is emitted in Russia. And the Russians have been willing to work through the Arctic Council process, first to measure it, and I think we'll be interested in working with us and others in reducing it. Even we in this administration are looking to do that too. So the picture is not entirely bleak. Sir. Sure. 
Boy, that's a great question. The question had to do with the attitudes of Arctic indigenous peoples to both protecting the environment and protecting their ways of life, if I can use that phrase, it's not actually the most felicitous phrase, on the one hand, and economic development on the other. I have a book to recommend if you haven't read it already. It's called The Eskimo and the Oil Man. It was written by a journalist named Bob Reese, and it, it's about two people I know, one of whom sadly has passed away, Edward Itta, former mayor of the North Slope Borough, one of the leaders of the uh, Alaskan and the Native Alaskans, and Pete Slaby, who is the head of Shell Oil in Alaska, and their relationship as Shell Oil was spending a lot of money in Alaska at Prudhoe Bay and elsewhere. And it poignantly captures the very thing you were asking about. Yes, the Alaskan indigenous peoples want to preserve their culture and their way of life, but they also want better hospitals, better schools. They want cell phones, they want high-speed internet. And yet, getting those things is a mixed blessing. And the attitudes of these people across the Arctic are not homogenous. The issues facing the Sami, the, what you might call the, the, the people in Lapland, in northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, I think some in Russia as well, are really rather different. They have very different lifestyles and different issues with their governments, but they too, in a way, are caught between trying to preserve traditional ways of life, like reindeer herding, and sending their kids to good schools. Um, but you know, in a way, aren't we all faced with similar questions in our own lives? Yeah, we like driving, but we know that the cars we drive are polluting the atmosphere and warming the planet. We like our lifestyles, are we willing to compromise them for the sake of environmental protection? The issues might be not quite as so poignant for us as they are for the Arctic indigenous peoples, but they're not wholly different either, I think. There's no real answer to your question and no real trend that I could detect. Ma'am. Thanks very much. The question had to do with how can we get people, say, who care about the ocean near here or other places, or really anywhere in the country, to understand that the Arctic is important to them or that they should care about it? Well, you said one thing that I really liked. The terminology has changed from oceans to ocean, single ocean, as though it is all one ocean. And in some ways, that is true. More symbolically, a lot of the problems of the ocean are common everywhere. Of course, there are regional differences. Well, one thing we did when the US chaired the Arctic Council is we brought one of the meetings of the Arctic Council to Portland, Maine. The Arctic Council met in Maine to make the point that people in Maine need to care about this. And we actually waged a pretty successful PR campaign around the country. We had all sorts of editorials and other talking heads all over talking about the Arctic. We had President Obama, the first time a US sitting president went to the Arctic. He went to Alaska for a few days. It brought a lot of media attention with him. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that has subsided, partly because we're not chairing the Arctic Council anymore, partly because for President Obama, and I would say Secretary of State Kerry, the Arctic, among other things, was a poster child for climate change, and they were working toward the Paris Agreement. And so to talk about the Arctic, to bring the cameras to the Arctic, was a way to build public support here and around the world for the Paris Agreement. No longer true. Other questions, please? Ma'am.
Thank you. So um, there are several parts to that question. One had to do with the fact that the United States has not joined the basic treaty relating to the oceans, the Law of the Sea Convention that I mentioned earlier, should we be worried about it. And some other parts of the question had to do with Russian activities in the Arctic, planting a flag on the seafloor at the North Pole, claiming parts of a continental shelf in a somewhat expansive, some might even say aggressive way, uh, build, rebuilding military installations, right? Did I capture that more or less? So um, let's, yeah, let's, let's take these apart a little bit, unpack this. Um, it is true that the United States has not signed the Law of the Sea Convention. It has been sitting before the U.S. Senate since the mid-90s. Three times the Senate has actually held hearings on it. Uh, twice it came to a vote in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Both times it was approved but was never approved by the full Senate. You know your constitution, right? You need two-thirds of the Senate to approve such a treaty. It's never happened. And it is a problem for us. We're the only Arctic country that has not ratified this. And it does affect our, both our diplomacy, but also potentially our claims to continental shelf and other things. And I think in time, we're going to need to join this treaty because um, of the economic and I would say some national security consequences of staying outside will outweigh the costs, even in the minds of the opponents. As for Russian military activities in the far north, yeah, um, here's one thing I've learned over the years. No government is monolithic. And of all the governments I've ever dealt with, I'd say that is most true of Russia. Its ministries are incredibly stovepiped. They don't talk to one another very effectively. I remember at the first round of negotiations on what became the Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, I was actually chairing the meeting. There were three people on the Russian delegation, one each from a different ministry. Two of them took the floor on the same issue. The first one said X, and then he passed the microphone to his colleague who said not X. <laughs> and I looked at them. You know, as if to say, please, can't you get your act together? I think the first time they'd ever met was at that meeting. And yes, the Russian military, remember what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It um, suffered rather serious degradation of its capacities. It is in the business of rebuilding those now. It plays very well at home, much as building a strong military in the United States tends to play pretty well here, too. Yes, they are building new airstrips. Some of what they're doing is actually related to the development of the Northern Sea Route. It's not actually a military undertaking, though it's being done in part by, military, um, by the military of Russia. Um, yes, Russia planted a flag on the North Pole, on the seafloor at the North Pole. That is the outer extent of Russia's claim to continental shelf. We will see whether that claim stands up. There are only five countries uh, whose uh, continental shelves extend into the central Arctic Ocean. Some of them may also be able to claim an area around the North Pole, particularly Denmark, possibly Canada, not Norway, not the United States. And they will have to negotiate a resolution. The Russian airstrips are not going to factor into that. Other questions, please? Yes, please. Uh, the question is, uh, w with the increase in shipping, will uh, the noise from the ships affect the marine life? I saw an article on this just today, or maybe it was yesterday. Um, if you are interested in this stuff, um, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission has daily updates about the Arctic, and I saw an article about that. Not that I read it, just the headline. I think the answer is yes. Noise from ships is a big issue. Also, drilling um, can affect particularly marine mammals, right? 
Um, and there are marine mammals and people who depend on marine mammals in the Arctic, including in Russia, the United States, Canada, and Greenland. Um, right now, the uptick in shipping is pretty modest, and probably the effects on marine mammals and other species are um, not so severe yet. But you're right that that is an issue to watch. It may become a bigger problem. Yes, please. Yes. The question is about polar bears and whether there is international cooperation. There is a treaty dating from 1973 among the five so-called range states, states in whose territory polar bears exist. I want to say US, Russia, Canada, Denmark, Norway. Yes, of course, up in Svalbard, there are, I've been there, there are polar bears. Um, there are different populations of polar bears. And my Canadian friends, anybody here from Canada? My Canadian friends, yes, will tell you that some populations of polar bears are increasing. In fact, may be larger today than at any time since those populations were being measured. Not all of them have seen population declines yet. But they were placed on the US endangered species list um, what, a decade ago, maybe not quite, on the justification that their long-term habitat, the sea ice, is declining, and they're not likely to be able to adapt to living on land in sufficient numbers. But yeah, the country, there's also a US-Russia polar bear agreement which regulates subsistence hunting for polar bears. So yeah, the short answer is there is international cooperation and the status of polar bears overall may not be quite so terrible yet, but the long-term prospects aren't great. I hope I answered your question. Sir. Um, the question has to do with comparing sort of uh, Canadian Arctic issues and U.S. Arctic issues. Um, yes, as you said, Canada has a much larger share of the Arctic than the United States does. And indeed, I think for every one of the other Arctic countries, being an Arctic country is more important than it is for the United States. We have a lot more people living in tropical and subtropical places than we have living in the Arctic. That's not true in Canada. Certainly not in Iceland, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Russia either. For Canada, being in the Arctic is a big deal. And under former Prime Minister Harper, it was particularly a big deal. He made a big deal of it. You asked in particular whether there is potential oil and gas development. Prime Minister Trudeau and former President Obama entered into an agreement, I want to say March of 2017, no, how would be 2016, March of 2016, um, that prohibited new development of oil and gas in the Beaufort Sea. This is the part of the Arctic Ocean that both countries share. And even though President Trump tore up that agreement, I think the Canadians still um, have prohibited any new development of oil and gas. It's not economically feasible to recover it now. I think that was the point that was being made earlier. Canada has a lot of the same issues in the Arctic that the United States does more generally. Indeed, I would say Canada Arctic, the Canadian Arctic, the American Arctic, the Danish Arctic, and parts of the Russian Arctic are all rather similar in what they're facing. And they're really rather different from the issues being faced in Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, which are much more developed countries up there, sort of different set of issues. Sir.
question had to do with the, um, the claims that different Arctic countries are making in the Arctic. What effect does it have on the various indigenous peoples throughout the Arctic? Did I get that about right? Um, let me get to, not sure that's the best map. The claims that we're talking about all start at 200 miles from shore and go seaward. The Arctic indigenous peoples, many of whom are very dependent on the ocean, nevertheless are not really out there. And so the actual answer is not that much. You also talked about the Sami. The Sami are having trouble with the governments of Norway, Sweden, and Finland, particularly Norway, and finding ways to preserve reindeer herding as a viable economic activity in the face of development up in northern Norway. That's sort of a separate question, I'd say. One more question, I think, and then we probably have to wrap up. Yes, please. Actually, you already asked one, so I wanted, I was, if there's someone else who has a question, I'd turn to them. Going once, going twice. No, you're it. Go ahead. The question has to do with the potential for oil and gas development around the Arctic Rim. Um, and it is true that, um, as I mentioned earlier, President Obama and Prime Minister Trudeau reached an agreement not to develop future oil deposits, at least in the Beaufort Sea. But looking around the Arctic, I realize these are busy maps. Norway was a very poor country until the discovery of oil in the North Sea, and now it's one of the richest countries in the world per capita. Russia, heavily dependent on oil and gas. So is Alaska. About 90% of the state budget comes from oil and gas revenue. There are people in Greenland hoping to become independent from the Kingdom of Denmark. They don't have the resources to do that today. Where might those resources come from? Look at this map. You'll see that off both coasts of Greenland, there is at least the potential for oil and gas development. Now, as we sit here today, this came up earlier, none of this oil and gas is economically viable to be developed with the price of oil and the technology that exists today. But if you're looking, and some environmental groups are, are hoping for something like this, for all eight countries to agree not to exploit any of these resources ever, I'm sorry to say that strikes me as unlikely. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun being with you tonight. Thank you all very much. I'd like to turn the floor back over to Dr. Chris. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight in this, the last of our fall lecture series, and we're looking forward to seeing you again in the spring. Yeah? Okay. Uh, we please ask you to keep the podium space clear and exit the theater to the lobby. If you participated in a survey, thank you. Um, make, sure you uh, make sure you return your completed surveys to the table in the IMAX lobby. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening. Oh, Ponce. Well, Ponce, I don't know if I have pictures with Ponce, do I? You do. Oh.